Grace and peace. I'm Pastor Aaron Garner, and I'm glad that you're able to join us for our Bible study in Isaiah chapter 57. And we're recording from my home this evening. And as we begin Isaiah 57, I wanted to do a little bit of review from this past Lord's Day, which uh, we looked at Isaiah chapter 56. And we noted how Isaiah 56 is a continuation of the blessings of God's justice and salvation and righteousness accomplished by the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 56 begins, and again, this is a continuation of what has gone on before, so we shouldn't forget Jesus and the servant of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. This is the language of the fourth servant song, going back to Isaiah 52 and verse 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. So notice that emphasis on salvation. And here in Isaiah chapter 56, we have the continuation of the coming salvation. My salvation is about to come. Isaiah 52 and verse 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations that all the ends of the earth may see our God and the God of our salvation. So again, these are um, picking up where we left off. Uh, we also noted in Isaiah chapter 56, where we have the blessing of the servants and Jesus' righteousness and salvation, even for eunuchs and foreigners. In verses 3 through 6, Isaiah says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord said, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Right? That's that distancing. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose to please me and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. So this is remarkable because in the old covenant, we learned this past Lord's Day, that foreigners and eunuchs were ceremonially outside of God's blessed presence. They were outside the house of God. A foreigner is a, a non-Israelite, a, a Gentile, and foreigners were not allowed to eat the Passover according to Exodus chapter 12. The eunuch, according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, was cut off from the assembly of the Lord. So they shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. And so one of the demonstrations that Jesus is the servant of the Lord is that those who were far off, including eunuchs and non-Israelites, the foreigners, they have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that's one of the focuses of the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and one of the glories of the new covenant, Paul expounds in verse 12, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So Paul is saying, uh, to use the language of Isaiah 56, we were like the um, the foreigner, we were like the eunuch, but even worse, Ephesians 2, we were dead in our transgressions and sins, but now Christ Jesus, who, um, well, while we were formerly far off, we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And the way that we are brought near to God in Jesus is by faith alone. Paul says in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Saved by faith and not by works, we learned, is a Sabbatarian proclamation. It's applying the law and its fulfillment by Jesus to those who trust in him, both Jews and Gentiles. We also noted this past Lord's Day in Isaiah 56, the emphasis on the Sabbath and the, the rest of the book of Isaiah, there will be an emphasis on Sabbath. So it's Isaiah 56, 
We'll find it in Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah 61, which is also how Jesus began his ministry in Luke 4. Uh, we'll see the day of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 4. And the book of Isaiah will conclude on a Sabbatarian note also. So these Sabbaths in these chapters of Isaiah are all rooted in the good news of Isaiah 53. And again, that good news of Isaiah 53, remember that atonement has been made. So transgression, iniquity, sin, these things will go back to Leviticus 16 and the Day of Atonement. And remember that every seven times seven years on the year of Jubilee, on the Day of Atonement, after atonement was made on the Day of Atonement, a Jubilee year would be proclaimed. And that's in Leviticus chapter 25. And that's how Jesus began his public ministry, uh, reading from Isaiah 63 and proclaiming the favorable year of the Lord. So as we'll be learning in the, the weeks ahead, as God gives strength and allows that the Sabbath is Christocentric. The Sabbath is Christocentric, going back to creation. It's through Jesus all things uh, were made. The Sabbath is Christocentric. When Jesus said from the cross, having made atonement, it is finished. That is a Sabbatarian declaration. And the good news in Christ is that God's righteousness and justice and salvation is found through faith in him. So ceremonially, which we are not under the ceremonial law anymore, but ceremonially in Isaiah's day, eunuchs and foreigners were far away from God. But after Jesus' death on the cross, they and we have been brought near by faith. Now, we'll be continuing this evening uh, by looking at how morally speaking, so there's a ceremonial aspect to the law, but then there is the, the moral law, the, the Ten Commandments. So ceremonially, uh, eunuchs and foreigners were far off, but morally, unbelieving Israel is far off from the Lord. Now, I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter 57 and beginning in verse 1. And uh, we'll be, this, is, uh, this will be the uh, passage that we focus on this evening. Um, verse 1, the righteous man perishes and no man takes it to heart. And devout men are taken away, while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from evil, he enters into peace. They rest in their beds, each one who walked in his upright way. But come here, you sons of a sorceress, offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute. Against whom do you jest? Against whom do you open wide your mouth and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of rebellion? offspring of deceit, who inflame yourselves among the oaks under every luxuriant tree, who slaughter the children and the ravines under the clefts of the crags. Among the smooth stones of the ravine is your portion, they are your lot. Even to them you have poured out a drink offering, you have made a grain offering. Shall I relent concerning these things? Upon a high and lofty mountain you have made your bed, you also went up there to offer sacrifice. Behind the door and the doorpost, you have set up your sign. Indeed, far removed from me, you have uncovered yourself and have gone up and made your bed wide. And you have made an agreement for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on their manhood. You have journeyed to the king with oil and increased your perfumes. You have sent your envoys a great distance and made them go down to Sheol. You were tired out by the length of your road, yet you did not say, it is hopeless. You found renewed strength, therefore you did not faint. Of whom were you worried and fearful when you lied and did not remember me nor give me a thought? Was I not silent even for a long time, so you do not fear me? I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you, but the wind will carry all of them up, and a breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me will inherit the land and will possess my holy mountain. And it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstacle out of the way of my people. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, 
in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the spirit will grow faint before me and the breath of those whom I have made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry and struck him. I hid my face and was angry, and he went on turning away in the way of his heart. I've seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and to his mourners. Create the pra- creating the praise of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So let's ask for the Lord's blessing on our time. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would grant now your spirit. Uh, Give us understanding of this prophetic word. May we not be putting our trust in idols. Help us to see those idols, though, of our own day, and may we be putting our trust in Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Now, as we look at Isaiah chapter 57, I want you to look at verses 1 through 2. And I want you to to think as we reread them what they mean. So I'll reread verses 1 through 2, and then I will pause and allow you for a few seconds to look at it. And you may have to pause uh, the video, uh, but I want you to to think in in your own mind in light of what we've been studying, what uh, do these verses mean? The righteous man perishes and no man takes it to heart and devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from evil. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds, each one who walked in his upright way. So I want you to think about verses 1 through 2. So look these verses over. And uh, again, you may want to pause, and then we'll, we'll come back and discuss these verses. All right. Hopefully you've had uh, enough time. Again, if not, you can uh, pause it again. But uh, God's people here in verses 1 through 2, uh, we, we might see death as a tragedy. And death certainly is an enemy, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. But verses 1 and 2 suggest that death is also a form of deliverance from the evil and suffering of this world. The righteous here and the devout are described in verses 1 and 2 as being taken away to be spared from the evil to come. And even then they find peace and rest in death in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, for example, we might think that it's a tragedy when uh, a a Christian dies or a covenant child uh, of the Lord dies. Again, death is our enemy. But those who die in the Lord are spared from the evils of this world. And so this is a a great encouragement. This is another way of of thinking about death. Sometimes God in his providence spares individuals who die, we might say prematurely. He spares them from much evil because there is much evil in this present evil age in which we live. Uh, Revelation 14 and verse 13 the Apostle John hears a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. So having looked at verses 1 and 2, I want you to consider how this chapter ends in verses 20 and 21. So there's a contrast between uh, the blessed who die in the Lord versus the the wicked. So notice verse 20 and, and this contrast. And I want you to think about this. But the wicked, as the chapter concludes, the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. There is no peace, 
says my God, for the wicked. So the, the contrast here between the opening and the closing of the chapter is a contrast of peace and mercy, right? There is there is a death that is merciful rest for the righteous, but it's the opposite for the wicked because after death, the wicked face the judgment of God. Since about 700 years after Jesus, uh, folks began putting on their, their tombs R.I.P., uh, which is Latin for rest in peace. But just because someone dies does not mean they are at peace. Peace with God is not found through death. Peace with God is found only through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is, according to Isaiah 9 and verse 6, he is the Prince of Peace. Remember Isaiah 53 and verse 5 says that he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our peace, our shalom, fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. So in order to find peace, whether it's in this life, peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, or peace in the life to come, you must put your faith in Jesus. There is no peace for the wicked. Now, verses 3 and following are a rebuke of idolatry and adultery. And you can think of idolatry and adultery in terms of the Ten Commandments, and sometimes the Ten Commandments are referred to as the two tables of the law, uh, referring to our responsibility to God in Commandments 1 through 4, and then our, our responsibility to our neighbor in uh, Commandments 5 through 10. So you have idolatry and adultery. Idolatry with respect to God, adultery with respect to our neighbor. And in the scriptures, and, and, and this, it's the case here in Isaiah chapter 57, that idolatry and adultery often go hand in hand, highlighting covenant unfaithfulness to God. And if you look at verses 3 and 4, there's a description of Israel's apostasy. And again, the striking thing about Isaiah 57 is you have the eunuch and the foreigner being brought close to the Lord in Isaiah chapter 56, and that the blessing of the Sabbath and that rest. But there is no rest here for wicked and unfaithful apostate Israel. And verse 3 says, But come here, you sons of a sorceress, offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute. Against whom do you jest? Against whom do you open wide your mouth and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of rebellion, offspring of deceit? And looking at verse 8, indeed, far removed from me. Again, you, 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 know, you would have thought, wait, it's the foreigner. It's the non-Israel. It's the eunuch that is far removed from God. Well, ceremonially, yes, but morally here. Now, God is addressing Israel morally far removed, you have uncovered yourself and have gone up and made your bed wide and you have made an agreement for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on their manhood. And so what we have here is Israel uh, going after the idols of the nations. And with this idolatry and adultery is a description then of their, their children. And part of this um, idolatry and adultery led to here in verse five, child sacrifice. So child sacrifice was part of the worship of certain Canaanite gods, such as Moloch. And the locations mentioned here in verse five, uh, under every luxuriant tree, under the clefts of the crags, these may have been sites known for child sacrifice. Now, this practice was strictly forbidden by the law of Moses. Leviticus 18 and verse 21, it is written, You shall not let any of your seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 2 also uh, forbids child sacrifice. And yet this is happening in Isaiah's day. It happened uh, with King Ahaz of Judah in 2 Chronicles 28, that he burned incense in the valley of Ben-Hinnom 
and burned his sons in fire according to the abomination of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. This was also the case of King Manasseh, and it was probably during uh, Manasseh's reign, at least according to tradition, uh, that Isaiah was martyred. And this kind of sacrifice and child sacrifice is mentioned um, by Jeremiah um, about the people of Judah. In Jeremiah 7, verse 31, they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, and it did not come to my mind. So you see with this idolatry and immorality, uh, it leads to death and even the death of offspring. You think of our own day and how abortion highlights the moral decay of our nation. And sometimes you find even in front of like Jewish synagogues, big signs celebrating women's reproductive rights. There's a big sign in front of a local Jewish synagogue uh, that I drive by, again, celebrating. And when women's reproductive rights are being celebrated as a, a Jewish value, the sign says, um, part of those rights that are being celebrated is the, the right for, uh, to abortion. And uh, sometimes, of course, you'll find these kinds of signs in front of liberal churches. And the same was true in Isaiah's day. You would find child sacrifice um, in Israel and even practiced by some of the Davidic kings. Idolatry and immorality, right? The wages of sin is death. Verses 6 through 8 describe Israel's idolatry and pagan rituals. So in verse 6, you have ravines and mountains and homes. So uh, in these verses, you have ravines and mountains and homes. So in verse 6, uh, you have the idolatry and pagan rituals in verse 6. Among the smooth stones of the ravine is your portion. They are your lot. Even to them, you have poured out a drink offering. You have made a grain offering. Shall I relent? concerning these things. Verse 7, it's not just in the ravines, it's in the mountains, which are often referred to uh, in Kings and Chronicles as the, the high places upon a high and a lofty mountain. And that's how God describes himself, as we'll uh, see later in the chapter. He is the high and lifted up, exalted God. But Israel was going to the high and lofty mountains there and offering their sacrifices. So you have it in the ravines, you have it in the mountains, and in verse 8, it's even this idolatry is in their homes. Verse 8, behind the door and the doorpost, you have set up your sign. Indeed, far removed from me, you have uncovered yourself and have gone up and made your bed wide, and you have made an agreement for yourself with them. You have loved their bed, you have looked on their manhood. Now, it might be easy for us to read these verses and dismiss them because you might think, well, idolatry is a thing of the past, um, but it's not. Covenant infidelity rears its ugly head in many different ways, and uh, one way uh, would be pornography. And in fact, I've read statistics, and again, I'm not absolutely certain, of, you know, I, I don't know if these statistics are true or not, but I've read that 68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors view porn regularly. Now, these verses here in Isaiah 57 are extremely relevant, and they should cause us to reflect on our own lives. Right? Do you have any sins that you engage in, not just publicly you know, in ravines or in the high places of the mountains, but in the privacy of your home? And if so, um, get help. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek accountability with other Christians and pray that God would deliver you uh, from evil. So verses 9 and 10 then describe the, the journey and the pilgrimages Israel was making, not to the Lord's house, but they are going to other nations. It was supposed to be the other way around. The nations were supposed to be streaming to the house of the Lord. But here God's people are going to the nations. So look with me at uh, verses 9 and 10, where the Lord says through the prophet Isaiah, You have journeyed to the king with oil and increased your perfumes. You have sent your envoys a great distance and made them go down to Sheol. 
You were tired out by the length of your road, yet you did not say, it is hopeless. You found renewed strength, therefore you did not faint. I want you to look here at verses 9 and 10 for a few seconds. And again, you might want to pause the video, but I, I want you to, to look at these verses and um, say, what, what do these verses mean? And uh, I'll be uh, right back in a, a few seconds. All right, hopefully you've uh, had enough time looking at verses 9 and 10. And um, so you have in verse 9, uh, this journey. And it, it, uh, it seems that what's happening here um, is that Israel is sending envoys to pagan rulers and to their gods. So you have to remember in ancient times, uh, you have the, both the, the church and the state uh, together. So to address uh, pagan rulers was to also be addressing their gods. And again, Israel is not going to Jerusalem. Um, and it's not the nations that are traveling like the Queen of Sheba as she traveled to Jerusalem. Uh, it's the, the other way around. They're going to great distances. Isaiah says they're even going to the great distance of Sheol and death. And uh, again, it's this is both metaphorical, but it's it's also literal, because the wages of sin is death. Child sacrifice uh, was an offering and a sacrifice unto death. So they're going to the, the depths and and even to the extent of Sheol excel, itself, the the place and of the grave. And verse ten explains that this was tiring, it was burdensome, and yet the Israelites persevered in these demonic endeavors. Even in their exhaustion, they did not give up on seeking help from foreign powers and their gods. Verse 10, Isaiah says, speaking for the Lord, you were tired out by the length of your road, yet you did not say it is hopeless. You know, may God give us um, that grace to, to come to realization as we depart from his ways. Uh, it's hopeless. Um, Isaiah says, you found renewed strength, therefore you did not faint. So it was, again, it's, it's hopeless, but they don't see that their unfaithfulness, uh, their stubborn persistence in their idolatry, their failure uh, to return to the Lord, right? They, they, they don't turn back to him in these things. And so as we, we look at verses 9 and 10, again, these are depressing verses. And again, this is uh, Isaiah very often speaks about judgment and that we'll be seeing uh, God's salvation as well. But here, you know, verses 9 and 10 should lead us to reflect and, and to pray something to the effect, God, I pray that I would never find strength in my sin. I pray. So sin does lead to hopelessness. It leads to people becoming faint hearted. Uh, and yet some people find in strange and perverse ways a renewed strength to persevere in their sin, which leads to death. So verse 10 is the opposite of Isaiah 40 and verse 31, which says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Looking at verse 11 of our text here, um, again, considering, and I want you to take a, a, a short time and, and reflect on verse 11, uh, where the Lord says through Isaiah, of whom were you worried and fearful when you lied and did not remember me, nor give me a thought? Was I not silent even for a long time? So you do not fear me? So I'll give you a, a few seconds to reflect on verse 11. And if you're watching this with someone else, you might want to discuss uh, what verse 11 means. Uh, if you have a study Bible uh, with you, in front of you, uh, you might even see if uh, in the, the footnotes at the bottom of the page, uh, if they give a suggestion for the meaning of verse 11.
All right. Looking at verse 11. Of whom were you worried and fearful when you lied and did not remember me, nor give me a thought? Was I not silent even for a long time? So you do not fear me? I think the idea here in verse 11 is that the things many folks are worried about and fearful about, they shouldn't be. Our fears and our worries are usually misplaced. The things that many folks don't worry or bother about, like lying or not remembering God, these things should worry us, right? If, if there's anything that worries us, be it, God, I pray that I, I never forget you. So may, may God grant a, a godly fear of us not giving him a thought or misinterpreting his silence as if that's a reason for me to forget him and not to remember him. Now, as we look at verse 12, Again, as, as God is addressing apostate Israel, those who do not believe uh, in um, the prophetic word and in the servant of the Lord. So these are those who are far off from the Lord. Uh, verse 12, I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. So what is the, the prophet saying here? God, you know, saying through Isaiah, I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. All right, looking at verse 12, um, in the context, your righteousness Israel's, right? This is apostate Israel. Apostate Israel's righteousness is a reference to their righteousness in relationship to their idolatry and immorality. Israel was acting according to the demands of false religions. So every false religion has its own standards of righteousness, right? So they were, they were, seeking after that righteousness. But the Lord says, I can declare that righteousness. I can declare your deeds, but if I were to do that, it would be of no profit. So just because of false religion or the world, and you, you have to understand that there, there is a form of morality that is to be found in, in paganism. It, it, it was believed to be righteous to offer up one's children to Molech. So just because a false religion or the world says that something is good or righteous does not make it so. The Westminster Confession of Faith helpfully reminds us that good works are only such as God hath commanded in his holy word, and not such as without the warrant thereof are devised by men out of blind zeal or upon any pretense of good intention. So non-Christians and, and pagan religions, they're, they're full of good intentions. But again, these good intentions, we must always judge them by the word of God. So what Isaiah prophesies here in verse 12 is very much like chapter 5, where in verses 20 through 23, the prophet says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of the ones who are right. So again, as, as we progress from verse 12 to verse 13, uh, there is a, a standard of righteousness that we might say in the eyes of the world. But according to God's word, it is of no profit. So verse 13, uh, consider what the Lord says here. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. But the wind will carry all of them up and a breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me will inherit the land and will possess my holy mountain.
So again, as we, as, uh, this is a Bible study, I'll uh, let you reflect on verse 13. Again, talk to others, pause uh, the video, and uh, we'll come back and we'll look a little bit more closely at verse 13. Right, this idea of crying out and for uh, deliverance. It's the idea of crying out for salvation, but to whom are we crying out? Right, so that uh, idols, right, you can cry out to them, uh, but they are unable to to save. But we have a fallen tendency to place our trust in things, and people, and political promises and alliances that cannot save. Uh, modern technology gives the illusion of salvation from disease and death, but it cannot save. In fact, technology can actually make things like the sacrifice of our children exponentially more efficient and on unimaginable large scales. So on a very small scale, you go back to the, the pre-technology of the, the Israelites and the, the age in which they lived in Isaiah's day some 2,700 years ago. And compared to the sacrifices of their children to Molech, uh, we have multiplied that by m millions of times uh, through abortion and through pills that cause uh, miscarriages and therefore the death of the unborn. So again, we can cry out to these gods. We can cry out to the righteousness of the world. Remember what the world says is good is often the opposite. It is evil. And that kind of righteousness, uh, that kind of de uh, dependence on uh, technology, it can never save. And so there is no salvation apart from the Lord. That, that salvation is only found through Jesus Christ. But notice here, so here, here's the hope. So there's a lot of uh, uh, depressing things in apostate Israel, and um, but there's a wonderful promise here in the second half of verse 13, where the Lord says, but, but he who takes refuge in me will inherit the land and will possess my holy mountain. So the idea of inheritance of the land uh, of course, goes back. Um, the, Israel is on the way to exile, right? They were going to be losing the land, but the land goes back to the days of Joshua, goes back to the Abrahamic covenant. It goes back to Adam and Eve and the land that they lost in paradise through sin. And what God is, is promising, that the one who takes refuge in him will inherit the land and will possess my holy mountain. And that holy mountain. So you had the earthly mountain, Jerusalem, but there's a, a Jerusalem from above. And that Jerusalem from above is described in Revelation 21 and 22. And God says you will possess that holy mountain that will come from above, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven like a bride, beautifully prepared for her husband. So it's a, a, a very beautiful call. There's a, a, a call to repentance but it's a call to take refuge in the Lord. So have you taken refuge in the Lord? And the way you take refuge in the Lord is by believing in Jesus, the servant of the Lord. Think of some of the Psalms that speak about taking refuge in, in the Lord. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So as we come to uh, verse 14, uh, verse 14 uh, says, and it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstacle out of the way of my people. 
So I, I, I'm going to pause the, uh, I want you to pause or, or take a moment here. Um, but what verse in Isaiah does this verse remind you of? So earlier in Isaiah, uh, we learned about preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. And um, so what, what do you think verse 14 uh, is, is teaching us? All right, I'm back. And hopefully, uh, as you've reflected on verse 14, um, you're just like, you know, that, that sounds um, a lot like Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord, and the wilderness make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. So you remember in preparation for the coming of the servant of the Lord, the coming of Jesus, uh, Isaiah also prophesied not only the coming of Jesus, but John the Baptist. And so Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, and we learn in the Gospels in the New Testament that it is John who is that voice calling in the wilderness, preparing the way for the servant of the Lord. Uh, verse 15, uh, very beautifully in uh, verses 15 through 19. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with a contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. This is the, the language of the throne room of God. So uh, just keeping your, your uh, eyes there on verse uh, 15, <clears throat> think of Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Uh, verse 15 here in uh, chapter 57 is also the language of God's servants in Isaiah 52 and verse 13, where Yahweh says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. And so here now in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, for thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place. And here's the good news, right? Here's the, it's like one of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. God also dwells with a contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. So if uh, you need reviving of your own spirits, reviving of your heart, you know, a heart uh, to be revived, to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, call upon the Lord. He is the, the high, the exalted one, the one who lives forever, but he also dwells with those who are lowly and call upon him. So here in verses 15 through 19, right? That, so uh, the earlier verses are, are very difficult words of judgment to apostate, unbelieving Israel. But now uh, this, this is a message of, of hope and healing for Israel's believing remnant. These are, uh, it's a message of hope and healing uh, to all those who are outside the Lord Jesus Christ as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Lord says in verse 16, I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the Spirit would grow faint before me and the breath of those whom I have made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, right? So there's our transgression, iniquity, and sin. I was angry and struck him. I hid my face and was angry. And he went on, turning away in his heart, right? So he's turned his face, he has hidden it. But God says in verse 18, I've seen his ways, and but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and to his mourners, creating the praise of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. So it's a, a wonderful uh, benediction. And uh, in fact, we'll look at the last two vic uh, verses, but uh, think of these verses as a, a benediction to those who tur turn to the Lord 
and turned to his the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then noting, noting the, the last verses of Isaiah chapter 57, and we already noted how Isaiah, this chapter begins and ends with peace. So there is peace for those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ, um, but there is no peace for the wicked. So the wicked are like the tossing of the sea that cannot be quiet. Its waters toss up refuse and mud. And then, again, as the chapter ends, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So there is peace for the one who turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would know that peace this is a good place to stop. But the, these are the, the words, and, and they remind us of uh, the, the benediction, going back to Numbers chapter 6. And uh, this is my prayer uh, for us, that the Lord would bless you and keep you that the Lord would make his face shine on you and be gracious to you, that the Lord would lift up his countenance on you and that he would give you peace.